So the title of my message this morning uh, is Bible Prophecy and the New World Order. I'm sure it's a term uh, that you're familiar with, you've heard. Uh, It's both in the mainstream media now uh, and also uh, amongst friends and and contacts and so on. Uh, So attempt to deal with that subject uh, this morning and give us some uh, guidance from what the Bible would have to say on the subject. As we've been reading there in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, there are some pretty predictable and constant things in this world. The sun rises and the sun goes down. Generations come and go. The wind always blows, the rain always falls, rivers flow into the sea. And it's like a big circuit that that goes around. There are some predictable things in this world. And as Solomon observes, as the years go by, even with his life, uh, things do become quite predictable. You notice there in verse 9 and 10 uh, of the passage that we've read, and we're thinking about the subject of the New World Order, uh, it says, The thing that hath been is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath already, it hath been already of old time, which was before us. So is the new world order new? According to Solomon here, it's not. And we'll see that uh, as we look at the scriptures. So there's some points there. History repeats itself, and there truly is nothing new under the sun. And sometimes, and I remember I first found out about this, perhaps in my late teens, New World Order and conspiracies and so on. It can come as quite a shock that the world that we see is, is not. There are darker forces at work. Perhaps you've met people that perhaps are afraid and overwhelmed by such uh, things as they arise. Uh, but we would be wise, like Solomon, to realise that there is nothing new under the sun. These things have happened before. And I would argue uh, this morning that the New World Order is nothing new. And <coughs> In different forms, it's been faced by every generation down through uh, the centuries and millennia. Really, it's just history repeating itself. uh, And even the nature of man uh, does become very predictable. Uh, Just to quote for you from Matthew chapter 24, uh, the end of the world will indeed be marked by great tribulation, as Jesus said, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time known or ever shall be. Uh, so, and also it says, but the saints of God have faced tribulation in every generation, and quoting here from 2 Timothy A, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And yes, the end of the world will be marked by the rise of the Antichrist, but the saints of God have faced Antichrists in every generation. Uh, to quote to you from 1 John Chapter 2 and verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So we can get overwhelmed and say, well, our generation is particularly difficult, or the evils are so great in our generation. But no, it's history repeats itself. And every generation of believers down through the centuries has had to face. Uh, and we're thinking about the New World Order, uh, that in particular. So perhaps I made a mistake. I went on to Google and typed in the New World Order just to see what the, the mainstream has to say. So I'll quote to you. I'm quite impressed with their definition, actually. Uh, so I'll read it to you what they have to say. It says here, the New World Order is a conspiracy theory. <laughs> so, surprise, surprise. That hypothesizes a secretly emerging totalitarian world government. The common theme in conspiracy theories about a new world order is that a secretive power elite with a globalist agenda is conspiring to eventually rule the world for an authoritarian one world government, which will replace sovereign nation states and all encompassing propaganda whose ideology housed the establishment of the new world order as the culmination of history's progress. It's not too bad a definition here, apart from the first statement, a conspiracy theory. So really, if I say the term New World Order, I'm really referring to a one world government, where one day you have a global world empire, uh, it's called the New World Order, but one world government or globalism uh, is uh, similar terms for that. So as you're thinking about the message this morning, New World Order is one world government, that's what we're thinking about, and then we're going to particularly have a look at what the Bible has to say. If you mention the New World Order to somebody, you usually hit a wall of scepticism. 
I had, I've had this plenty of times uh, before. And sadly, that skepticism is often from Christians as well. Uh, they'll say to you, oh, that's just a conspiracy theory. Uh, and so the media has done a good job uh, with them on that subject. Uh, perhaps a mistake that we make is we then respond to that by offering evidence. So we'll say, well, a new world order is true because of such and such an organisation, or so and so said this, and you then offer your evidence to try and prove uh, the existence of the new world order. Uh, you may say to a Christian friend, well, you do realise they're pushing for a cashless society. And then you quote from a website, and you quote from a politician, you say, well, this person said we need a cashless society. This shop doesn't take cash anymore. Can't you see that it's all happening? And still often you're met with skepticism. People say, well, I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, and they often uh, reject your evidence. The mistake perhaps that we make is that we neglect our authority. What if I could prove to you that a one world global government is real and is coming using scripture as my foundation? Then if you're talking to another Christian and you say, well, this is what the Bible says, how can they not accept that? So my argument this morning would be to use the Bible first and then any evidence and observations that you see around you just back up what the Bible has to say. So I think that's the mistake that we, of <coughs> the mistake that we often make. I've done it myself. I offer, you know, I say, watch this documentary, go to this website, listen to what this person has to say. When instead, if you're talking to another Christian, use the scriptures as your foundation and then it's up to them whether they accept or reject the word of God. So Bible focused, hopefully for you this morning, to equip you with the scriptures that you can use. And I propose to you that uh, the New World Order will see it throughout scripture, but uh, it is a strong uh, position from the word of God. So the question is, can we prove the New World Order or coming one world government using only the Bible? And the answer to that is yes. And then we'll also consider how this fits in with Bible prophecy as well. So I've got a number of points for this morning. The main point will be one world government. That's what we'll, we'll focus mostly on. And there's a couple of things attached to that in smaller points. Uh, so point number two about the one world religion, which is connected with that. And also number three, uh, the pursuit of godhood and everlasting life. But the main point will be uh, this one world government. And there is a golden rule for us to remember as we think about the scriptures. There is a golden rule that you must always consider. And that is that the devil always wants the opposite of what God wants. What God says, the devil wants the opposite. And if you're here this morning, you say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't accept that, that God's will is the same as the devil's. You've got serious theological problems. Uh, so just keep that in mind. That the devil, what the devil wants is the opposite to what God wants. And that will help us as we consider uh, this subject this morning. So I uh, encourage you very much to turn to these scriptures. That will be the word of God that speaks to us this morning. So the first passage uh, it's not Revelation, it's Genesis, please, in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. So point number one is this one world government. Do we see it in scripture, past, present, and future? Genesis chapter 10, and if you go down to verse 32, Genesis chapter 10 and verse 32, The Bible says, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations, in their nations. And by these were the nations divided after the flood. So after the flood, God divided the nations. That was God's will at that time. Nations were set up. What we would call national sovereignty. It's one nation here, one nation there. Not the world all as one, but divided up as nations. So therefore, it's not God's will that nations unite with each other and ultimately seek to form a one world government. If you uh, flip over a few chapters, I will move on to the Tower of Babel next, so Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. So God's will is national sovereignty, separate nations. And then Genesis chapter 11 and verse one, we're thinking about the Tower of Babel. It says, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So now you've got a unity going on here where mankind's come together. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick, and burn them freely. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, 
whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth, or upon the face of the whole earth. So you see man in his rebellion, God says nations, man says no, let us unite together as one. So that spirit, that uniting spirit, is seen right here in the book of Genesis, even without turning to Revelation, it's there at the very beginning. So really this whole subject is dealing with the nature of man, is the root of the problem here. The spirit that drives man to unite together, and then we then look out across the world around us, and then we see that happening. But our foundation for this is scripture, that's where we get uh, our primary evidence from. So verse 4, lest we be scattered, that's man's will, is that he doesn't want that to happen, he wants to unite together. And then uh, continue to read on here, verse 5, it says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. The Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So now you're starting to see the motive of why God wants man divided up into nations and scattered across the earth. Why does God not want this unity? Uh, because when man comes together, it accelerates his evil. And so whenever you see nations join together, they may say, well, it's for a good reason, we'll try and stop wars and so on. No, the problem is the heart of man here, that when man unites, it amplifies and accelerates his evil. Uh, I quote to you from Genesis chapter 6, uh, from just before the flood. It says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So there's God's motive for splitting up the nations and to keep man separated and away from each other. I guess it's like a class of children, isn't it? Individual children are nice and pleasant. You put them into a class of 30, and then what happens? They turn into monsters. And so we see it in the classroom. Perhaps the world is the same. Bringing the world together is not uh, a good idea. And like a good teacher, children have to be separated uh, away from each other. And back to, verse, back to the chapter 11 here, Genesis verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So at, I watched a bit of Star Trek growing up, and they had a world there of no war, no disease, and everyone uh, got on well with each other. Uh, and it was like a utopia in the future. But they neglected one thing, and that's the heart of man. And it's not going to happen because of the corruption uh, of the heart of man. So God in his wisdom says, divide the nations uh, and keep them separate from each other. But man in his rebellion says, no, bring the nations together and try and bring about another Babel. So continuing on here, Genesis chapter 11, verse 7. Go to, let us go down. And there confound their language, they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So God's will is that mankind is divided into nations, and for man to be scattered across the earth, as opposed to united together as one nation and language. And the reason for that is that when man unites together, it accelerates his fallen, evil nature. So back at Babel, that is your one world government. It's happened before, and God's will that it was divided up and scattered. And I propose to you that man has been striving to come back to Babel down through the centuries. So pick any dictator through history or any uh, strange cult-like system and, and so on, and you can see a rising up of the Antichrist spirit trying to unite the world, and then... The enemy comes in like a flood, it's destroyed, you know, Hitler failed, and then years later something else happens, and you just see that rising up each time as man attempts uh, to come back uh, to Babel. But that is in the heart of man. And so this concept is nothing new, and the political leaders and organisations of the world today trying to bring the world together, that's just history repeating itself, as we've read about in the book of Ecclesiastes. So uh, I'll quote to you from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, just a, a verse here. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So, politicians may look smart and nice on the television, but the Bible teaches us, no, there are dark forces at work. And we've sort of uncovered a lot of the motive here, the uniting spirit that's trying to bring people together to bring us back 
uh, to Babel. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you have he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There is a spirit at work in this world today and the, the drive to unite the world together. So when you see an organisation such as the European Union and they have a building in Strasbourg and they base that building on uh, a famous piece of artwork by Brugel of the Tower of Babel. Well, surprise, surprise, that that's, that's that spirit driving them to unite the world and they base one of their main buildings on the Tower of Babel. So that comes as no surprise. So we've got scripture, then we observe what's going on in the world and it, the two match up. But we could do it in that order first, scripture first, and then we observe and see what's going on around us. So as we think about one world government, we can't neglect Daniel's visions. So I have an assistant here, which will bring us up an image on the screen. Okay, as reference for you, I printed it out, but I think that's better for us. So I'll just be referring to this a few times uh, and keep it as straightforward as possible for you. And perhaps for some of you here, this is new to you. You've not seen a picture of this before. You've not heard about these passages in scripture. Uh, but if you go to Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, we can't address this subject without uh, briefly going through Daniel's vision here, or Nebuchadnezzar's vision and the interpretation uh, thereof. So Daniel chapter 2, and then we will start at verse 31. So Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. God reveals to Daniel the interpretation and Daniel gives the interpretation of that to the king. And really what you're going to see here is the layout of world history before you. Scripture has it all contained for you uh, here in the word of God. So Daniel chapter 2 verse 31. It says, Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee. And the form thereof was terrible. This image's head of, was of fine gold, his breasts and his arms of silver, his belly and his fires of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were there of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together. <coughs> And became like the chaff of the summer freshening floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. We will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. So we're not left in the dark. Now comes the interpretation of what that means. So verse 37. Thou, O king, this is the king of Babylon, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath given un, he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over all of them, or them all. Thou art this head of gold. So the head of gold is the Babylonian empire. So you can't have a Christian that says to you, I, I, I'm not sure what that vision means, and we don't know what the head is. The Bible tells you what it is. It is the Babylonian Empire uh, that was set up uh, in Scripture. So the head of gold is the Babylonian Empire. Uh, that ends in 539 BC. as uh, when the legendary Persian king Cyrus the Great uh, conquers Babylon. Then verse 39. And after these shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, another third kingdom of brass which rule over all the earth so you've got two kingdoms now rising you've got the uh, the medes and persians which is 550 to 330 bc uh, two peoples nations coming together medes and persians and if you note on the image the two arms so that fits in just nicely with that then you've got the third kingdom which is alexander the great and his grecian empire and obviously there's more scriptures that give information about that uh, but that are the, that's those three kingdoms there. Now, if you go to verse 40, the reason why we're looking at this is you'll, you'll start to see one more government being talked about here as well. Verse 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. This is the, the, a particularly powerful kingdom. And as iron that breaketh in pieces 
should it break in pieces and bruise. So the fourth beast is the Roman Empire, famed for its crushing power and brutality. The way the Romans conquered uh, the known world, uh, they were marked for their crushing power and brutality. And if you note the legs, you've got two legs there. Uh, the Roman Empire was split geographically. Uh, you had the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire historically that Rome did split into two. Uh, Rome also split religiously as well, and that's continued on to this day. So you have Eastern Orthodox Church, then you have the Roman Catholic Church, the two arms uh, religiously of the Roman Empire uh, as well. So it fits again exactly with the image that we see before us. And in verse 41, and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So there is a mixing and a weakening of the image uh, towards the end. And obviously you've got the ten toes there as well. And as verse 42, and as the toes of the feet are part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And I'd argue with you, proposed to this morning that the Roman Empire has just continued on. Uh, religiously, it still continues on uh, through the Roman Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, and then in a weaker form, uh, we have still inherited the Roman Empire, but obviously it's not as strong uh, as it was uh, back when it began. Uh, some will say, and when I looked up images for this on the internet, there's all different interpretations uh, going on. There's different conflicting views uh, on this. Some will argue and say, well, the ten toes are ten periods of the Roman Empire, and they'll say, well, it's all split into different times and so on. But logically, if you look at that image, the toes are at the end of the feet. And so if, if it's a time scale, we're looking for those ten toes to form at the very end before Christ's coming. Logically, it would uh, work that way. So perhaps we'll see, and I'm not going to make claims here, but perhaps we're to look out for a one world global empire that's broken up into 10 regions. It would be logical uh, to suggest that. Some Christians will say, well, it's the reformation of the old Roman Empire, split into 10 areas, and they'll point to most of Europe and so on. Uh, but personally, I would think it's, as each empire's got bigger, that the final empire will be a global government. And you'll say, well, you know, the UK has to be wiped out and France has to go, and it all has to be won. But if you look at empires down through time, they've often kept their titles and, and names. You know, when Rome ruled the world, you still had Macedonia, Britannia, Gaul, and so on. Nations kept their titles, but they were part of uh, that one empire. So bear that in mind. You may not have to see the complete er erosion entirely of names of nations and so on, uh, but more of a, a, a controlling empire over the nations. Verse 43, whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Isn't that interesting? If we think about what's going on today, the, the mass migration of peoples across the world, and I, I always wonder what, what drives these people to move from like Africa and to shift all the way across the world to come, to come here, or to shift from one nation to the next. Do they not care about where they've come from? You, know, to, you think about yourself, imagine if you uprooted your family moved to Japan or some far distant country, the disruption of that and the change. And yet there seems to be the spirit that's driving men to move all around the world. So perhaps we're starting to see that, and the end world government will be a, 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 the seed of man mixed across uh, the earth, like a great end times Babylon. Verse 44, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So now we've got Christ returning here to sort out this world, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So that's our encouragement as Christians. Christ returns to this earth and set up his earthly kingdom, and that shall last forever. If you then flip over, please, to Daniel chapter 7. Another golden rule is to always compare Scripture with Scripture. And you'll get more understanding and more enlightenment as you compare different passages of the Bible together. Daniel chapter 7 will give us more information uh, of what we've already considered. So Daniel chapter 7, if you go down to verse 
uh, 17. This is the vision of the four beasts, which will give us more details about these four kingdoms. So four beasts, four kingdoms uh, here. But verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth, these four empires. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, uh, even forever and ever. So Christ's return, uh, the saints will reign with him, as we've seen in Daniel chapter 2. Then verse 19. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue of his feet. So again, we've got this oppressive Roman Empire, uh, the fourth kingdom. But it, it goes beyond that, the brutality of this final empire. Verse 20. And of the ten horns that were on his, in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. This is talking about the Antichrist. This person that will rise up at, at the end, at age here. Verse 21. I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints this great persecution prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom so during that short reign of antichrist there'll be a tremendous persecution of christians which is known as the great tribulation which will be worse than any form of persecution that's ever happened before verse 23 thus he said the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and this is thinking of this one world government, and shall devour the whole earth. And that's why I propose that it's a global government, not just the old Roman Empire, but the global form of government here, because it devours the entire earth. And it shall tread down and break in pieces. So there it is, that's your one world government. We've seen it there at Babel. We see it here at the end of time. And then in between is just that struggle to bring it about down through history. So Christians that say, oh, I'm skeptical of all these things. How can that be true? You say, well, let's start at Genesis, yeah. Daniel, and Revelation. It's there throughout the whole of Scripture. Verse 24. And the ten, horn, and, and the ten horns out of the kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. I'm talking about the ten horns, ten toes. And another shall arise after them. He shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak, this is the Antichrist, he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and seasons, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. It's an interesting uh, combination of words there, but uh, time, one year, times two years, and then dividing of time, half a year. Add that together, it's three and a half years. Keep that in mind as we come to other passages so the culmination of this great image when these ten toes are, are formed is the uh, the antichrist rising up to lead a global government or a new world order so that google definition was correct just take out conspiracy theory and it's pretty accurate in what it says so if you want to look into the subject deeper uh, your key passages and i was advised this uh, the, a minister said just look at these passages and go away and study them so i'll call them out to you and you're free just to read them over and compare them and overlap them with each other. Daniel 2, Daniel 7 and chapter 8, uh, Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, Revelation 13, and then Matthew chapter 24 to see what the Lord Jesus Christ had to say as well. Read those passages and compare them with each other and that'll give you a good strong foundation as far as Bible prophecy is concerned. So, Old Testament we've seen, now we'll think about what's written in the New Testament. Uh, Revelation chapter 13, if you flip over uh, to the end of your Bible, the last book, Revelation chapter 13. And the, 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 the amazing way the Bible overlaps here, what's talked about in the Old Testament, New Testament, matches up perfectly. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. I encourage you to put a bookmark or a marker in this chapter because we'll keep coming back to it. Revelation chapter 13 and the first verse here, talking about the rise of the Antichrist. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. 
And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. So if you remember the images from earlier on, leopard uh, would be a Grecian empire. And his feet was as the feet of a bear. So they meet a Persian empire. And his mouth was the mouth of a lion. That's your uh, Babylonian empire. So there's a, a combination of all of them here being mixed uh, together, elements of each. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So you've got your previous empires. There's no mention of the Roman Empire here. So perhaps this final empire is the continuation of Rome with elements at the end of all the others being mixed in, the, the way they, those governments and leaders operated, there'd be elements of each uh, being added in. But I'm not going to get into that uh, here this morning. Continuing on to talk about the Antichrist, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? And they were given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, if you do your mathematics, that's your three and a half years again. So, Old Testament, New Testament, talk about exactly the same thing. This great tribulation, uh, three and a half years, a short reign of Antichrist, where he heavily persecutes believers. Uh, and then verse 6, and he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. There it is again, your one world government control uh, here at the end. Your new world order. So this one world system at the end will not be pleasant. And for sure, just to quote to you, George Orwell, he said, if you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on the face of a human forever. Now, obviously a man with no hope of Christ's return, but that's the future that he saw, the rise uh, of this new world order uh, government. If you go down to verse 16, talking about the Antichrist again, don't want to tread too much on Jonathan's subject here. It says, and he calls if all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and their foreheads or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he, he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So we know that the saints of God won't accept this, but there you have your one world economy and global control as far as the economy is concerned, just like the Tower of Babel, which we've been reading about in the Old Testament. So really we have a one world government at the beginning, a one world government at the end, and in between the struggle of rebellious men to get there. So in summary here of this first point, this is the, the main point of the uh, main part of the message. So God's will is that the nations of the world be divided and mankind spread over all the earth. Man in his rebellion along with the devil and his minions seeks the opposite of God to bring the world together as one, just like at the Tower of Babel. This is the heart of man and the legacy of human history. Study human history and you'll find the rise of many antichrists seeking to bring about global empire tyranny and oppression. Is the New World Order merely a conspiracy theory? No, it is the truth of human history in every generation and the truth of what is to come in the days ahead according to the Word of God. A couple of other aspects I want to cover here. Uh, if you go to Daniel chapter 3, thinking about one world religion. Just two more briefer points for you, but didn't want to neglect these just to bring these in just to tie the whole thing together one world religion we're thinking about and again you'll see i've talked about the spirit of antichrist rising up at different points in human history we're going to see it at a time in history where it's recorded in scripture so Dan daniel chapter 3 and verse 1 and when we see it rise up in history it gives us a type or a shadow of what the future would be like so you'll see it here uh, with king nebuchadnezzar daniel chapter 3 verse 1 Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the councillors, the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the, the treasurers, the councillors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So this is you bringing everyone together. Everyone has to turn up to this event. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. This is a universal command across the empire. 
that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king have set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So there's your one world religion. A time in history where it rose up uh, there in the Babylonian Empire. And obviously that came to an end uh, and that was destroyed at that point. So then if you go back to Revelation chapter 13, thinking about the end empire. Verse 4. And they worshipped, says worship here, they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and powers given unto him to continue 14 two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell therein. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and powers given over him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And in verse 8, for a one world religion, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. So that's one element of this final empire, uh, is uh, this uh, worship across the world uh, of the Antichrist, whose name is not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And in verse 11, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth who had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercised of his, all the power of the first beast before him, causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, that he, that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of whose miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to him that dwell on the earth, they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the beast, to the Im image of the beast. The image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So an example in history and in scripture, and then we see it there at the end, uh, there of this final empire. So a hallmark of globalism be an increasing drive and eventual implementation of a one world religion. And we see evidence of this all around us. So the Bible first, and then we look around and we see this happening today. So we're not surprised when we hear uh, about, and this is a, a quote here, uh, a one world religion headquarters is set to open in 2022. The headquarters will be called the Abrahamic Family House and is being built on an island in the middle of east, the eastern city of Abu Dhabi. Headquarters is is being done in collaboration with Pope Francis and Sunni Muslim leader uh, Sheikh Amin al Tayeb, after they both signed a global peace covenant called the Document of Human Fraternity for World Peace. Another quote says the Abrahamic family house is a collection of three religious spaces, a mosque, a synagogue and a church, all of which sit upon a secular visiting pavilion. That opened a few weeks ago, 1st of March. So that's your summer holiday sorted out. You can, <laughs> you can go out there and, and have a look at the Babylon being reformed. Uh, but just it's that same spirit that's driving man, bringing the religions of the world together. And we've seen that. I've seen it growing up as a Christian, diff different documentaries and so on, different attempts to just unite the religions together. Uh, it's that same spirit that drives them to do it. Uh, the final point here is become like gods and live forever. Uh, I'll just quote to you from Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. The origin of, of this drive is satanic. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto, into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And Satan's drive is to be like God. He seeks, seeks to usurp God. God offers us everlasting life, but it's through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we can live forever. And remember that golden rule, Satan seeks the opposite. So Satan will offer man an alternate route to everlasting life. If you turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. So think out what Satan's desire is that to usurp God and to offer the opposite of what God offers. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. 
And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, and I shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So this verse 4 is your promise of everlasting life. You won't die. You know, follow my will and you won't. In verse 5, your eyes will be opened. This is your greater wisdom and understanding. If you follow me, I'll give you greater understanding and wisdom. Uh, we see that with the secret societies, secret organisations, the pursuit of wisdom. Uh, the, the devil offering that to those followers. And in verse 5, uh, you shall be as gods, knowing good, good and evil. You can become like God if you follow the devil's plans. There it is at the very beginning, uh, there in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, the devil seeking to undermine God and offer alternatives to God's way. So is it no surprise when we then observe the world around us that there is a globalist agenda to pursue everlasting life, life extension technology. It's a little bit grisly, some of the things I'm going to read here, but this is the insanity of man and where the devil will take you if you depart away from the truth of God. I'm sure you, some of you have heard of transhumanism. It's a quote here uh, from Wikipedia. I have to improve where I get my, my quotes from. Uh, transhumanism is the philosophical and scientific movement that advocates the use of current and emerging technologies such as genetic engineering, cryonics, artificial intelligence, AI, and nanotechnology to augment human capabilities and improve the human condition. So help us live longer. Uh, another quote here. Uh, that first quote is from Britannica, sorry. The second quote is from Wikipedia. Transhumanism advocates the enhancement of the human condition by developing and making widely available sophisticated technologies that can greatly enhance longevity and cognition. So you see, what's this race? Why is man trying to come together and push science? He wants to try and live forever. Uh, are we surprised to hear about cryonics, which was uh, more popular, perhaps more talked about a number of years ago, but it's been seen as a bit of a, a failure. Uh, it's the low temperature freezing, usually at minus 196 degrees Celsius, and storage of human remains, with the speculative hope that resurrection may be possible in the future. Some customers opt to have only their brain cryopreserved uh, rather than their whole body. And there's, there's places with frozen heads and they're waiting for technology to improve and then you can build them back. Uh, rather than the whole body, as of 2014, about 250 bodies have been cryopreserved in the United States. And 1,500 people had made arrangements for cryopreservation of their corpses. Well, there's a, a company in the United States called Nectome. In 2018, a Y Combinator startup called Nectome was organized for developing a method of preserving brains with chemicals rather than by freezing. Now listen to this. The method is fatal, performed as euthanasia under general anesthesia. But the hope is that future technology will allow the brain to be physically scanned into a computer simulation neuron by neuron. It's insane. Man in his blinded rebellion, seeking to escape death. It, it is a drive of Venice. I don't want to die. I'm sure you don't want to die. But I'm staking my hope in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the devil offers something else. Uh, and it's just this, this emptiness here. There is no answers here if you follow the devil's plan. It, people don't stand a chance freezing their heads and uh, pickling their, their brains. <laughs> So, to find some other way outside of God's plan to live forever, a tragic part of human history since the fall of man and Eden. Again, if we go back to Revelation chapter 13, just to link past, present and future together, so Revelation chapter 13, thinking about the pursuit now of everlasting life and the Antichrist. You know, each time you read this, you, you see things that you didn't see before. And uh, this is verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. 
The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, a fatal wound here on the Antichrist. And his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. Perhaps the final culmination is this Antichrist. People say oh, this man is going to die and then he's healed and the world says, well, what does he discover? What is this? What is it? perhaps some technology that he's discovered here and the world wonders after the beast? And you could imagine it. Mankind, you know, some revelation that this, this person's discovered how you can live forever. There would be a stampede to find out uh, what that technology is. And that's perhaps what is offered at the end by the Antichrist. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? So we have Antichrist healed from this deadly wound. He deceives the world. And really it's the Antichrist, they're repeating the devil's lie. Ye shall not surely die, ye shall be as gods. Genesis, Revelation, uh, both teaching the same thing. So the more you think about it, the more strange uh, this end times government will be. What we live in now we may think is insanity, but I think at the end it's going to be a strange, strange place to live, uh, for sure. Uh, I think it's beyond my lifetime, I think. Uh, and it'd be perhaps for future Christian generations to, to deal with, but what they'll have to go through, and what they'll see, uh, the Lord will help them, I'm sure. Uh, and we've seen uh, elements of it rise up in history, strong delusions sweeping through nations. I've been listening to a series recently about the rise of Nazi Germany and the hysteria that gripped a nation. And that gives you a, a glimmer or a shadow of what perhaps the end time empire will be, this hysteria and occult-like following of different world leaders and I'm sure it'll be the same for the Antichrist at the end. Revelation chapter 19 please, Revelation chapter 19, we think about what is the end for these empires and the final empire and the Antichrist and those that follow him. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11 Revelation 19 and verse 11 I hope these messages today will help you Bible prophecy, a lot of people have been put off by it with strange and bizarre claims that have been made, uh, strange interpretations and predictions that haven't happened, you know, barcodes, the mark of the beast and so on. And people say, oh, just Bible prophecy is too complicated. But I hope today you'll discover there is great blessing in considering these things and that we do need to keep a level head and not make strange predictions and so on, to be very cautious about doing that and to take a very sensible Bible-based approach uh, to Bible prophecy, as we should with all of the Bible. Uh, and not clutch at strange uh, doctrines and so on. But Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, as we finish, finish this morning and think about the coming of Christ. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Who is this? This is the Lord Jesus Christ. What a day that will be. And I guess one of the privileges for those that remain is they'll see this. Uh, called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed with fine linen, white and clean. Some say, oh, it's not going to be white horses. Yeah, it will be. I believe that. that this is literally, that's what we'll see coming from heaven. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that which it sh he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath in his vesture and in his fire a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that he may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them. And the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. That is their end. Uh, the eternal incineration of them in the lake of fire. The devil was a liar from the very beginning. And this globalist agenda of the pursuit of wisdom, knowledge, and the possibility of living forever 
is really just an age-old continuation of mankind chasing after the devil's empty promises. So I encourage you, don't get caught up with that. I'm sure there are people here this one that aren't Christians. I encourage you, it's great to learn about these things, but make sure you're on the right side, uh, and you're on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. And eternal life then can be yours through the gospel of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. I quote to you from John chapter 8, verse 31, just some words from the Lord Jesus here. Then said Jesus to those Jews, this is John chapter 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The liberating power of the word of God. And that's not just through the gospel, but through everything the Bible has to teach. Uh, it can give us liberation and freedom uh, when we discover the truth of God's word. And do you want to live forever? Jesus is the only way. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then perhaps my favourite verse in the Bible. Uh, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? That's John 11, verse 25. Do you believe that yeah. here this morning? Then you will never die, as the Bible says, that so you'll live forever with Christ in heaven. The Bible teaches that man is sin and rebellion. The devil of his fallen angels have strived since the fall of man to bring about a one world government, a one world religion, and the ability to become like God to live forever. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Leaders come and leaders go. But the same Antichrist spirit has been operating down through the centuries, seeking to make this ambition a reality. As the rebellion was at the beginning, so shall it be at the end. This is not a conspiracy theory. It is an historical fact, a growing reality in our world today, and a truth taught most clearly in both the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. And so to conclude this morning, uh, if you go to John chapter 20, a few more passages of Scripture and they'll be finished. John chapter 20. Such revelations, as I talked about, when I first found, about these, found out about these things as a Christian in the New World Order, uh, it was quite startling, uh, quite a scary thing to consider. Uh, and the temptation is to adopt a, a bunker mentality. We say, well, this, the world's too scary, I, I better just wait it out. I better not go out and, and preach and speak and, and so on. Uh, we'll just wait and see what happens. You know, we're up against such opposition and so on. But as we've talked about already, the New World Order is nothing new. Christians have had to face this in different forms down through every generation since Eden. So what would God have us do as believers? John chapter 20 and verse 19. John 20 and verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, this is after the resurrection, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Surprise, surprise. Man, that's his nature, fear. Uh, the, the disciples had shut the doors, make sure the doors are closed, and they're cowering in fear. Uh, assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so I send you. Even so send I you. So don't be afraid. God is with us. Copy what Jesus did. Go out and minister and witness and preach. Mark sixteen fifteen. What does Jesus send us to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Not to be bound by fear, but to go out. Now, this is what I've been thinking about recently. Jesus Christ was born into a one world government, was he not? The Roman Empire. He was born into the middle of it. Uh, to quote to you from Luke chapter two and verse one, the nativity. It came to pass in those days that went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This is a one world government in operation. You think about what Herod did to those infants in Bethlehem. We don't read about any justice or any recourse from that. He slaughtered children and got away with it. What? The, the time that Jesus lived was way more oppressive than what we live in now. And yet we read about the Lord Jesus Christ. He just went about his father's business, not carrying in fear. And he often rebuked the disciples not to be afraid, but to be going about your business. And we can become self-defeating 
And we think, oh, they're watching us. Or we, I, I can't go out. You know, they're after me. And we can get that bunker mentality. But Jesus would say, no, go about your business. Hold your head up high. Go out and hand out your tracts. Go out and preach the gospel and be bold. Uh, and that's why even with the meetings, so we advertise them publicly. I'm not going to say we're having a secret meeting and we'll, we'll check everyone that comes through the door. No, we, we will boldly go about our business uh, as the Lord Jesus Christ did himself. Uh, it was a brutal time to be like, even some uh, decades later, remember Jerusalem was leveled by the Romans, it was destroyed. It was a, a mightily oppressive time to be alive. And even with the early church, you think about how the persecution that they suffered, and yet they went about still preaching uh, the gospel. Uh, I'll quote to you from Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So Jesus didn't become preoccupied with what the Romans were doing and global empire and so on. He had his mission from God and he went about uh, fulfilling that amongst the people of the land. So you'll see that throughout the New Testament. Yes, he interacted with the Romans at times and so on, but you'll see him just focused on his task, uh, moving amongst uh, the people that were around him and encourage you to do the same. Yes, it's great to learn about these things and it's, you can tuck it in your memory and you understand the way the world is and the way it's going to be, but don't, don't let that distract you away from your task of preaching and spreading the gospel. So he got on with the work, was busy about his father's business and we ought to do the same. Imagine an army. Imagine if you're part of an army. And the army's there and they say, oh, the enemy's attacking on the left. The enemy's gone behind us. Uh, the enemy's doing that. All they do is repeat and tell you what the enemy's doing. What an army to be in. What a defeated force. Isn't an army better when it goes out and says, well, this is what we're going to do. And so I, I, I know Christians that just say, well, have you read about what they're doing? Have you heard about this that they're doing? It's just a constant report of what the enemy's doing. I'm saying, well, that's great what they're doing. Why don't we do something? Why don't we go out and, and, and make the news instead of just re reading the news of what others are up to all of the time? And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did uh, as well in his ministry. And in Romans 13, and that knowing the time, and now is high time to wake out of sleep, verse 11, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armour of light. And I'll finish through a quote from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, which is appropriate here. This is a Baptist church. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a man of great eloquent words. So focus on what he has to say here. It's quite technical. He said, brethren, do something, do something, do something. <laughs> so let that ring in your ears. While societies and unions make constitutions... Let us win souls. I pray you be action, men of action, all of you. Get to work and quit yourselves like men. Old Surovov's idea of war is mine. Forward and strike. No theory. Attack. Form a column. Charge bayonets. Plunge into the centre of the enemy. Our one aim is to win souls. And this we are not to talk about, but to do in the power of God. And so I encourage you to do the same. Be brave. Do something and you can make a difference uh, and invest in heavenly things and things that will be uh, worth your while uh, in serving the Lord. May God bless his word to us in Jesus' name. Amen.